wait, remember Magi Nation? The animated series that was based off of a card game and had a video game before the show would even come to be? There's quite a bit here that went into this fantastical adventure, with the show aspect feeling like the least talked about and the most forgotten when it comes to it being in the cultural zeitgeist. But never fear, I want to dive into it all, from its origins to its expanding out into the show that it became. We're gonna see what Magi Nation started out as, what it became, and what happened to it. Well, I wouldn't go that far. Magi Nation, from the most popular format of it being introduced to me, was the animation. The show came out in Canada first on September 8th, 2007, and then a couple weeks later on September 22nd, 2007 in the US. It looked like a nicely made show that had all of the elements of the other shows surrounding it at the time that I was super into. It had monster battles and magic, and this feeling of a grand adventure, so it definitely pulled me in initially. I mean, come on, it has a theme song that's catchy, and it even has a whole middle mystery part like, hey, who's that? creature. But in the world of the show, we follow Tony Jones, the most fake sounding name anyone could ever come up with, who is a kid from Earth brought to the Moonlands through the power of this ring necklace, as he is to be believed the final dreamer. Well, I guess there is more than just one, since he ends up traveling with these two others he meets in the Moonlands, a Magi apprentice named Eden and a shadow stalker named Strag. If I'm throwing a lot at you right now, I will explain these terms. Just stick with me and maybe we'll get some McDonald's after this. Together, this ragtag group must collect dream stones, tame, summon, and use monsters known simply as dream creatures, which rather than catching them in some sort of device or logical way that shows how this function works, they kind of just learn to trust you. And if you show that you're a good person to them, then they'll just kind of aid on your cause, then turn into these stones or gems that can be called upon for use later. It's not the most well thought out capturing and battling system, but it works basically enough to just get the creatures captured or stoned you know what, befriended sounds better? It's a nice way of doing it, a respect of the creature wanting to actually be with the Magi, but it lacks any um, oomph or flashiness to it, which while being more introspective, comes off a lot more lackluster and less satisfying in the end. But that doesn't mean everything surrounding just that bit is boring or uninteresting, quite the opposite. We follow a story surrounding this evil shadow Magi named Agram, voiced by Martin Roach, who was sealed away and locked within the core of the Moonlands for his evil ways. Because he is evil, what else do you do with an evil dude? But thanks to the strength of his void powers and persuasive shadow manipulation, he is trying to break free of his prison with the only true adversary strong enough to defeat him being the final dreamer, Urs, which is the one, or, or three, that can sure dream the hardest, or, or something. Seriously though, Tony, voiced by Leon Smith, is this teenage kid who isn't ready to become the hero this land prophesized him as. But through his time there, and the friends that he meets along the way, he's able to really come into his own, not being afraid to stand up against Agram and do whatever it takes to help the Moonlands. Joining him on his adventures is Eden, voiced by Martha McIsaac, who is from the Moonlands, who not only is a great companion and friend overall to Tony, being very trustworthy, but is the glue that keeps everything together on their adventure, as well as being an ambitious magi in training under Orwin, a mentor figure that we spend some time with as well. The third member of the group is Strag, voiced by Dan Pat Tronajevic, who comes in handy on this adventure as a shadow stalker, being trained to directly deal with shadow magi to clear them out of the Moonlands in general. While he may have ties back to the shadows through his bloodline, he doesn't let that stop him from doing what must be done, often being the most focused and confident member of the group. The creatures themselves do play a large role, obviously, in the show, with more reoccurring ones that are shown to be the main group's partner dream creatures, like Farak, Uger, and Freep, but not limited to only just seeing them, with a nice variety of fun and imaginative creature designs. Oh, that's where the name comes from. I get it now, I'm learning. The first season on its own is pretty self-contained, leaving season two to be this fun continuation of the show that takes the series into some new territories and some cool new surprises to find, and at least wrapping up with an ending that doesn't just leave you on a cliffhanger wondering for the rest of your life what the heck happened. But as I mentioned at the start, this show is not just a show. It was built upon the world of what both a card game and a video game built around five-ish years before this cartoon would come to be. So let's explore what all of that was because to understand why this show exists and what it truly is, we have to look at where it truly started. I imagine Ogre! I imagine Barack! 
So first, let's take a look at this, the card game, briefly. Since the card game was technically the start of what this property would be, really easily seeing the influences of other card games and other franchises within the artwork, style of the card, and how it's played here. Having this goal of essentially being a mid-tier level in difficulty and complexity compared to others around it. It's not as deep as magic, but it may require more thinking than your average game of Pokemon at the time. Releasing in October of 2000, this new-to-the-scene card game was made by Interactive Imagination, or 2i, with people who knew the space, co-founded by Philip Travel, who worked on the mechanics of the game and wanted to tailor them in a way that resembles Magic the Gathering, and Craig Richardson Von Oy, the other co-founder, would playtest the game and make sure it was structurally sound along with professional game players to stress test and curate it into something they would be more confident could work. Originally released under the term limited to make the initial release a lot more special, the set contained a total of 190 cards, and started the card series off with five regions, which essentially are the different gameplay styles to set up your tactics through attacking, defense, manipulation, and denial. You and your opponent face off against each other with three magi, where you cast spells, use relics, and summon these creatures to deplete the energy from opposing magi to eventually win. It's simple enough to really pick up, but deep enough to have fun with building a typing you vibe with best and working in strategies from there. There was an actual attempt to make this a viable, long-lasting card game, where after the original set came out and had a reprint in early 2001, there were four expansions that ended up following that. Awakening, Dream's End, Nightmare's Dawn, and Voice of Storms, with each set introducing more regions to the game. The final expansion released in November of 2002, meaning that the game lasted around two years and they did plan on releasing a fifth set called Trader's Reach, as it was being worked on but never fully produced, with other announcements of a set called Daybreak, and a new generation base set of sorts called Second Order, but having a potential focus on reworking previous cards with new artwork and updating them as the game would grow to fit in the rules, strategies, and keep everything playable. I always admire seeing creators really support their card games as much as they can, especially when it comes to stuff like actual tournaments, or at the bare minimum, trying to support the community that is choosing to try and support them. 2i would help organize leagues and some tournament play that would also feature earning some exclusive promo cards that only can be received at these events by defeating someone who was representing 2i, which makes them feel more rewarding, more so than anything. While I was personally never big into the card game, only somehow acquiring a few random cards here and there over the last handful of years, the card game had some balancing issues, which could make sense as the reason for some players dropping off of it and 2i wanting to revise some cards with that second order set release. The real big thing outside of the card game before we even get to the show is the video game, the Game Boy Color game of the same name. It even pulled a Yu-Gi-Oh and came with cards inside. Well, a card. But it officially released in March of 2001, right after the start of the card game, as we follow this anime protagonist looking fella named Tony Jones. Again, the most fake sounding name anyone can ever come up with. And a completely different look from the show, which I will get back to in just a bit. He's a human who has been able to travel from Earth to the Moonlands and looked at as this foreseen savior of the world, where he must take on all of the shadow magi that are in his way and face the ultimate evil, Agram. Just like the show would kind of eventually follow. Agram here is using his abilities to enter the minds of magi on the surface, from his residence in the core to manipulate them into becoming shadow magi. Another easy enough premise to follow that makes the journey throughout the game interesting enough, but surprisingly the game features a lot of grinding as an RPG to get through it, as the main gameplay loop consists of creature taming, turn-based battling, as the battles show up as cards until you attack where you get some little fun animations. The job of the game though, most importantly, was to develop brand awareness with the game to bring more interest into the card game itself. But to give the game some genuine credit, it on its own is a lot of fun. The story can be a bit generic in terms of the overall setup of the foreseen chosen one coming from Earth to this other realm to save the day. But the details from the graphic abilities of the Game Boy Color at the time and how fleshed out the world seems, it feels like a competently made shorter RPG experience that is very much a fun time and seemingly very thought out in production. Feeling that a lot more love went into the production of this game more so than just making it a marketing tool for the card game. These Shadow Geyser dungeon-esque moments in the game do add a bit more fun and adjustments to the battling gameplay, offering you a bit more to do and feel like you're exploring more of the world, understanding the lore and finding all the secrets that the game holds. Sometimes though, the level designs can be a pain to navigate, being either confusing in how to navigate or just not being clear on the objective at hand. So it's very give and take with what this game offers, but overall I'd say it's still a really solid experience and 
a nice way to get into Magi Nation in general outside of either the card game or of course the show that would come years later. But when it came to the wider expansion of Magi Nation, specifically bringing it to Japan, they saw some small but visually major differences. For one, Japan would get the Magi Nation game, but now released on the Game Boy Advance instead, along with a complete rework of the main character. Gone is Tony and Hello is Dan, a much more anime aesthetically created character that takes over anything Tommy was on, from being the main lead in the game, to representation in the card game, and even a serialized Shonen Digest manga series that would see a really cool manga adaptation of the property just now featuring this Dan guy. But that doesn't mean Tony was gone for good. In fact, in the puzzle game Magi Nation Keeper's Quest, Tony would be there for this US released game, but it never came out for the Game Boy Advance like it was trying to. Instead, coming out for certain cell phones and PDAs, stuff like that, years later in 2003. A full-on sequel game to Magi Nation titled Magi Nation Invasion was in development for the Game Boy Advance to further the story of Tony, and I guess Dan in Japan, but during development it was stopped and never finished. At this point, it seemed like the end of the property. The card game was done, the video games were done, and it seemed pretty radio silent. Then after that, a show would eventually be made out of the property, which we basically started going into as it would be a way to try and build from there a way back into the space for awareness, but essentially was a reinvention or reintroduction to capture a new audience with a bit more force this time. Similar to other card games or video games like this having a hit cartoon to go along with their property. Cookie Jar Entertainment would get the license to this property and really wanted to give the series another shot, focusing on producing a show that would last for two seasons with 52 episodes, which is no small feat to do, and wanted to re-expand out into the larger world of merchandising and capitalizing on any hype around it. While there was no video game exactly like the original on the Game Boy Color, Cookie Jar put focus into an MMORPG that would be called Battle for the Moonlands. In December of 2007, this game would go into a closed beta phase to really test out everything, with an official release in March of 2008, a month after a small open beta. This was calculated by Cookie Jar as a part of their online, on-air, and on-show strategy, wanting to have the show, an online gaming experience, and a physical one when it came to the trading cards. Yes, the trading card game would even make a comeback, well, at least it tried to. In 2008, during the run of this content strategy, the card game was now in the hands of Cookie Jar as well, who wanted to release a new version of the Magi Nation card game, but unfortunately, this is where the card game ended, and nothing has come from it since. But we can see what differences there would be in the look of these cards, going for a more full-frame look to the artwork away from the looking through a window sort of artwork. It would have still retained a lot of the similarities to the original card game, but again, nothing came of this. As well as that MMORPG eventually closing down thanks to not having a strong enough player base to hold up support on the game, as well as the other aspects of this property falling apart and ending. But as far as the one thing that Cookie Jar really wanted to push with this license, how was Magi Nation as a show? What did it offer in the animation realm in terms of storytelling, adapting what source material was there while making some significant changes to make a hopefully compelling story? Let's take a look. I imagine Charmander. When we look at the show that would come years later, there is one major difference staring you right in the face. Tony. This is not this Tony. Gone is the blonde hair and edgy late 90s, early 2000s attitude, and here is this brown-haired, typical, quirky, but determined protagonist that takes the same name as the Tony we once knew and creates a whole new character, essentially, when watching the show. If you've never played the game, then you got nothing to compare this to. And to be honest, this is like a reboot in many ways. Wanting to start over with the story, with Tony entering the Moonlands in a different way from the game, meeting other characters to adventure with, feeling more like a traditional adventure show or anime with three characters that travel around. One element that I think they were able to capture well in the show that reminds me of the game is the way in which the characters learn and grow. Most times on their adventures learning how to be better at certain skills and tasks outside of just worrying about the creatures and bad guys. The video game really took its time to get you ready, training you and teaching you things constantly 
consistently, keeping a nice natural progression of what is happening. The show, to an extent of just seeing these characters interact with one another and the others throughout the land, really helps drive the camaraderie this group has, the bonds that they build and their knowledge of everything this world has to offer. It may sometimes feel like information that outside of these characters learning it feels really pointless to the overall plot, and that is fair sometimes, but I never really minded it that much as I was enjoying these downtime, more filler-esque moments in between the larger story beats. We get to dig deeper into the lineage of Tony, where, surprise, the reason he may just be here after all and be this great final dreamer, along with the other two final dreamers, is that his grandfather was also a Magi, making his connection a lot more real and understandable to this world. In connection to the video games and what the card game set up for the lore of the Moonlands and for this property, I like how much this show tried to really tie back into it. Having use of the Shadow Geysers being these connections to the core, where Agram is and seeing how he has this power while even being sealed away, and all the efforts that he goes through to get out of there and cause unimaginable chaos, while our heroes have to gather all of these dream stones that lead back to a final one supposedly being held by Agram himself, or so at least we believe at first. It has a decent enough structure that likes to break the mold here and there with not just wrapping up stories within the runtime, but rather letting the stories breathe a little bit, having more of an impact, especially when more serious moments happen throughout the show. So I appreciated that it respected me as an audience member enough to give me moments to ponder on or speculate on, making the experience revisiting the show a surprisingly really good time. I can easily see all of the tropes that are here and that are present in every single other cartoon like this, for ones that have come before it to plenty that came after. But I found the journey in this specific show interesting enough that it has its own spin on these things and for that kept me engaged with what it was offering. It's not the deepest or most complex show, but the lore surrounding it makes it worth the dive into, especially with what's surrounding it. From the video game being a great and fun vessel to put yourself into the story of Tony, to the card game that is pretty cool, saying that as someone who is a fan of collectible, trading, and competitive card games. And of course, an exciting enough cartoon that is able to be viewed and enjoyed with other programs along the likes of something like Chaotic, which this kind of looks very similar to, and that's thanks to Dong Wu, Animation and Entertainment, fully working on this series as an original production for them and having a hand working on the second and third season of Chaotic. So I guess the shoe does fit there. And again, the show ended after 52 episodes throughout two seasons specifically because viewership was harshly declining as well as ratings, leading to a cancellation and it not even getting to finish airing the entirety of season two on TV, with the final 12 episodes being dropped online in 2010. In the end, you can look back to where it all started and still play into the Magi Nation card game, but through the means of Tabletop Simulator Online, as there is still a fan base out there that is dedicated to it. And I love that the internet really can help bridge fandoms together like this, whether it's something bigger like Pokemon or something a bit more niche like this. And who knows, anything can come back these days and sometimes things do come back in different ways to make it more accessible or to take it in new directions. But fandoms do hold a lot of weight, so being vocal and showing your support for what you love truly can help make a difference more than it seems. If you're into card games, video game RPGs based on card games or shows based on card games and RPG video games, then Magi Nation is a multimedia property worth checking into. Even if it only does you know, all live in the past. I do feel that there's a lot of fun to be had there and a small yet active community that does a great job at maintaining what Magi Nation was. If you watched, played, or collected anything to do with this series, let me know your personal memories and thoughts in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching. Like and subscribe. Later.